a reading out of Colossians chapter 1. You can turn if you want to. Um, beautiful passage here, as is true with the scriptures. If then you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, notice that language there in verse 3, your life is hidden with Christ in God. That means the only way to know the life of God is to know Christ. The only way to really know true Christian life, let's set it that way. Use familiar phrase. The only way to know true Christian life, because it's hidden. It's hidden. That's why the church doesn't have it. I'm not kidding you. We're just doing a bunch of solical things, calling it Christianity. Well, that's God's got more for us than that. Way more. I know this would start like a rat sandwich, but I'm just pointing something out. Christianity sucks and people are abandoning it. But it isn't Christianity that really sucks. Christ's life does not suck. <laughs> what sucks is a form of Christianity that's religious. Isn't that true? None of us signed up for that nonsense. If you came to Jesus and was born again, you signed up for Christ, didn't we? To know the Lord, to know the Lord is to enter into a hidden life that the world knows nothing about. Let's be real clear with this. All that's in the world is not of God. And that it's in the church creates a real problem. So I just thought I'd point that out. That's what Paul's trying to point the believer to, that to know the Lord is an entirely other than life. Did I say that clear enough? Let me say it one more time. To know the Lord is an entirely other than life. It is heavenly. Come right down here on the earth. Christ himself had heavenly life living right here in this earth. And he was not like any other being on the planet. And to have fellowship with him was to come out to him. It still is. God's got something for the church we've not tasted yet. I'm not just talking about us. I'm talking about all of the whole body of Christ. He's got something for the church we've not tasted yet. We're going to have to eat of him and partake of him. That's really what Paul's getting at here. Let's look at verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed. So there's the key. It will demand the revealing of Jesus Christ inwardly. There's the foundation. The foundation is an inward revealing of Christ as my life. It's not praying a prayer. It's not getting saved. That's not the foundation. Christ is the foundation, but Christ revealed in us is the foundation. So we say, well, Jesus is the foundation, but that's, you know, that's not really getting to the issue. The real issue is not just Jesus is my foundation. It's Jesus revealed in me as life is the foundation. And that's where a new living being, a new species, a new creation, a new type of human being emerges. And that by the work, as you guys know, of the cross the emptying of self, the filling of the Lord is the process of it. And it's inescapable. There's no shortcuts. Well, anyway, uh, we are meant to experience God's form of Christianity. We never have. But God help us that we never will. That we won't go on in the way that we've been going that we'll experience him and his life 
in a way that has never been known by any of us. But it's going to take the cross working corporately. I'm talking about in the body of Christ. It's going to take the cross working individually within us to separate us from a former life. We've all had former life. We think, see, we think former life is only our sin life. God's talking about all of it. And that's a great deception in the church. We think, well, it's just a former life is what I used to do. He gets rid of that too, the old man, but it's more. Former life is not dealing just with the old man. <clears throat> I know this is, uh, I know what this does to the church. I, I can feel it. Here's what it does to the church. It brings us on an unknown ground. It's meant to. We've got to get comfortable being on an unknown ground. To ever go on and eat of him and have revealed to us this hidden life. Remember, Paul's talking to Christians. He's not talking to the world. In Colossians here, he's writing to the Christians at Colossae. Don't y'all feel like we for too long have projected our life and our form of life into Christianity and that's why we're in the mess we're in? I'm convinced of that. We're going to have to be willing to go through an exorcism, an emancipation of the Holy Spirit and be emancipated from all that we were and all that we knew, all that we had become, <coughs> even as Christians. So what else is it going to look like? We're not going to know until we come up to eat of him. And there's a fellowship in him. There is a fellowship. It's not friendship. That's earthly. There's a fellowship in him that is unlike anything we've ever known. And uh, it's worth the cost. It is. It's worth the cost of going on to know him. So... That's what Paul's revealing here in this passage. <clears throat> when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, it's going to demand that the veils of all that we've known of life to be pulled back and removed. And it's not going to be any longer our life or lives for God. It's going to be his life. And it's something fresh, and it's something new, and it's something the world knows nothing of. But the problem is, neither does most of the church. <laughs> so when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you will be revealed with him in glory. Glory is attached to this new life in its fullness. I've talked about this before. That fullness of life of Christ in us actually is the life that brings glory to God because it reveals him as that life within the believer, within the congregation. So uh, I, I read this and said, commented on it because in our praying today, I wanted just to target some things. That's what I felt stirred of the Holy Spirit this morning to do this. I wanted us to target specifically as a people some things specific to this passage here. If God takes it beyond this morning in our lives, let's set this way, so that throughout the week and the coming weeks, he has us in this passage praying, targeting, not just for ourselves, yes, for ourselves, but for the body of Christ to come into the fullness of his life, to have the right foundation, Christ our life. That not to be language, that not to be just a cliche, that not just to be a phrase that we heard and now have adopted, but it has no realization of life in us. <clears throat> but instead, for the Lord to have something uh, of a people who are hungry for what we've never known. And we can pray this passage. It's a beautiful passage to pray. It's a beautiful passage to have some real intercession over, don't you think? For the sake of his body, for the sake of his inheritance, for God to finally have what Romans 8 calls the revealing of the sons of God. Those are life-filled believers who have in exactness the life of God in them. 
And it's, he's got, listen, God's going to have that before this, the end of this age. He's going to have a people who will go all the way with him in this. I simply want to be a part. Yeah. I do. We'll all in the room have to make up our minds whether we want to be a part of it. I've already made up my mind. I aim to be a part. And it's extraordinarily disruptive. And we're going to have to get used to it. Disruption. Don't you think? I know a lot of people think, when does the disruption end? When the life of Christ comes to fullness. Think that through. When can it end? Except when the life of Christ comes to fullness. When does the emptying end? When they come to fullness. When does the work of the cross end? When we come to fullness. And even then it doesn't end. Because it's the nature, it's the eternal nature of God. So anyway, let's stand. <clears throat> we can take this a little bit at a time here, starting with verse 1. If you have been raised is the prerequisite. You cannot get to the life of Christ if we're still wallowing in former death, former darkness. It's if we have been raised. Let's cry that out for a little bit here concerning the body of Christ. Billy Graham said that he believed that 50% of the church is not born again. I think that's a low estimate. I think it's more like 85%. He was being kind. <laughs> Seriously. I think it's maybe higher than 85 Lord, we're asking for a people to come out of the death and out of the darkness of religion, Christian religion. We ask for that by experiencing you who are the resurrection and the life. That's what you said about yourself. I am the resurrection and I am the life. And you must be the resurrection before you can be the life in a people. You must bring us up out of the death of our former life, not just our old man. And we cry that out for the church of the living God in the nations. Come up out of death. We say of our own hearts, come up out of every measure of darkness. Come out. Come out of it. Come out to the Lord, to the light, to the life that he is. Lord, may we have your burden in this matter. May that burden be upon us, not just this morning, Lord, but as we move forward, our hearts burdened, burdened, burdened for the people of God. The lack of life, Lord. The lack of thus your testimony. The lack, Lord, of your exalting. The lack, Lord, of your glory. The lack of the light that is you, Lord. It is a devastating effect that is taking place within the congregations of God across the nations, Lord. And we cry out for your divine intervention, Holy Spirit, upon our own hearts and upon the hearts of your people. Bring to us conviction, Holy Spirit. Convict us that darkness must not be our day. That there's a new day in Christ, a day of resurrection, and a day of life. Convict us, Holy Spirit, of our willingness to dwell in darkness when you called us into your glorious light. Convict us, Lord. of refusing to come to you that we may know this hidden life that is in you and partake of you and eat of you the life we choose to eat your flesh and drink your blood you said otherwise we have no life in ourselves we choose to eat of you Lord we choose to partake We say, Lord, as in verse 1, we will keep seeking the things that are above. I ask you to brand that upon our very minds and hearts, Lord. 
to be seekers of you, to seek that which is of heaven, that which is the heavenly that we've been called to, Lord, to be seated with you in the heavens. For that's where you are seated. And we would be in you, Lord, and you in us. Set our minds on the things that are above not on earthly things, temporal things. Set our minds on things that are above. Cleanse our minds and cleanse our hearts, Lord. Our very desires to be clean. Let's just go after that for a second. Let our very desires be cleansed. Let there be an emancipation in our very desires from the things of darkness, from the things of death. Give us a hunger for Christ as light. Christ as life, true bread, true drink that you are, Lord. A greater hunger, release that to us, Holy Spirit. A hunger for Jesus. Just said, I want a hunger for Jesus. I want to know him. In you, we would choose to live and move and have our very existence. Not in anything former. We set our hearts, we set our minds on you, Lord. You who are seated. You who have conquered death. You, Lord, who has scattered the darkness. Because in you, Lord, is unapproachable light. The unapproachable light of life. Now being offered to us, though, Lord. We will not refuse you. We would not grieve you, Holy Spirit, by choosing the dark things of this life and of this world. We renounce them. Just say it to him if you mean it. Renounce the things of darkness. We renounce them. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Therefore, having this ministry, we have renounced the hidden things of darkness. We renounce them. All forms of darkness, everything that has even the slightest taint of darkness upon it, we renounce it, Lord. From its roots to its fullness, we renounce it, Lord.
us, Lord. That your hidden life would no longer be hidden to us, Lord. But you would be revealed. We ask for the revealing, the unveiling of Jesus Christ in each of us. And in your church again, we ask for the unveiling of Jesus Christ. You become veiled again. That is clear to us, Lord. Your life is hidden. It has been, Lord, this fall into darkness and back into decay and death that is in so much of what's called your house, Lord. Bring us up and out, Lord, by eating of you and partaking of you. That this hidden life no longer be hidden, but that we, Lord, see you clearly through unveiled eyes, the eyes of our very hearts, that we hear you clearly, unmuffled ears, Lord, that the world may know that the Father sent you and that you have come up out of the grave and are seated, you have ascended and you have, are seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. That the world may know, that they may see your life in us. Your life through us. John 17, Jesus said, that the world may know. Lord, what can they see? And what are they seeing? And what is worth seeing if it's not you, Lord? Let the hidden life of Christ emerge. Come up within us, Holy Spirit, with that fresh life. Begin to take the ground that we are. Begin to take possession of us. Possess us with your life. Yes. Let your life remove the hidden darkness in us. Yes. Replace it with the hidden life. Yes. Yes. We ask for mighty deliverance. Listen, that's what we're asking for, isn't it? We're not kidding anyone. We need a mighty deliverance. And we have a mighty Savior. We have a mighty King. We have a mighty deliverer. Exert your divine energy and bring to us complete deliverance from the hidden darkness and death. That we may experience your hidden life and light. Invade, Lord. We give you permission. Invade, Lord, these hidden areas. These secret areas. These things man can't see, but Lord, you know it's destructive power within us. The lies that it allows to live. No more the lie. Say it to him. I don't want to live by the lie of darkness. By the captivity of the lie. Be the light of truth in us that makes us free. Be that in us. Make us free, Lord. By your life and light. Fill all in all, Lord.
give you permission, Holy Spirit, to shake every foundation in us. Every false foundation that Christ may be our foundation, our very life. Shake the other ones. Just let go, my friends. Let go. Let him shake it. Let him shake it to utter destruction. Rip it from us, Lord. Every false foundation. Every false thing we've depended upon. Our own energy, our own strength, our own minds, our own workings. Rip it from us. Let's be clear. All things, Lord, we put our trust in other than you. This false foundation, rip it from us, Lord. Rip it from us. We trade all our false knowledge for the true knowledge of Jesus Christ. All our religious knowledge, rip it from us, Lord. To the knowledge of the one true Son of God. Yes, Lord. Becomes ours intimately, Lord, within the knowing of you. Not just about you, Lord, but the knowing of you intimately. We ask for it, Lord. Rip it out of us, Lord. Rip out of us these false things, Lord, that have been crutches that have been props. Rip them from us, Lord. Catch us with your own hands, Lord. Pick us up with your own hands, Lord. Breathe your Holy Spirit fresh within our lungs, within our being, within our hearts, within our minds within our eyes, within our ears. Breathe, Holy Spirit. Your very breath, O God. The Spirit of the living God. Life, life. Life in the Spirit. Beyond the natural, beyond the carnal, beyond the normal, beyond the endemic. Breathe. Your new life into us by your spirit. Just breathe for a second. Let the Holy Spirit feel us from within. Fill us with your divine strength, God. Human energy and strength won't last through this battle through this conflict, through this war. We ask for your divine strength to stand on holy ground. He won't be strength to us if we stand on false ground. He won't come to us if we're standing on self ground. We'll have to come off our own ground and come up We'll find him to be abundant life. We'll find him to be supernatural strength. So we take that step, Lord, off our own ground, off our own righteousness, off our own understanding, off of our own wisdom, off of our own resources. Spiritually and naturally. We come up to you, Lord. As you call to us, come up here. We come up.
inside the life that you are We breathe inside the life that you are We breathe inside the life that you Yes, we worship you. We worship you, Lord of Lords. the Holy Spirit among us. He's in a uh, doctor's uniform. Um, He has a scalpel in his hand to perform heart surgery. It is the buildup of religion upon our hearts. He would cut it off of us. It has become a weight on our hearts and an obstruction to our hearts that is not the Lord. Remove it, Holy Spirit. Take the scalpel and cut it from us. Free our hearts from the power of religion, from the power of Christian religion, that we may turn, see the Lord Jesus and come to know him as you meant for us to. Free our hearts, Lord. Free our hearts from these false weights. Free our hearts, Lord. Free our hearts. Help us, Holy Spirit. Cut, cut. Free us that we can see Jesus again. We can know the Lord Jesus Christ as our life. 
as our all in all, we would know Jesus. Help us, Holy Spirit. Free us. Free us, Holy Spirit. Open our eyes again. Unencumber our hearts. Unshackle our hearts. Release a joy of the Lord yeah. as the strength of your people once again. The joy of Jesus Christ and His knowing of Him into our hearts again. Release that joy that breaks the yoke. The yoke of religion. Release your joy, Lord. Fruit of the Holy Spirit very life of God. Joy. Even in the midst of battle and conflict, especially there, your joy, Lord. trading in my heaviness for what you're offering right now yes, to me. You have your arms outstretched and you are offering yourself to me. I'm laying down that heavy ground for what you're offering. are extended now yourself is what you're offering to me
target something before we shift here. Um, this thing of, I'm convinced that there's a hidden life of Christ that's hiding in the shadow of the cross. They uh, began to experience that in the book of Acts. It was nothing short of a revolution as pertains to the world. But they did not have the fullness of it there. God is inviting us in this generation to something greater than Acts. He is. A life, a life expression of Him in a people greater than the book of Acts. The seed form of it was an axe. The fullness awaits. Lord, we would be a people of fullness. Right now, Lord, axe looks pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I have to confess that. <laughs> Acts would revolutionize the nations again, wouldn't it? That kind of release of the Lord as life. But he has more for us than that, doesn't he, Jack? More than that, guys. Acts is not our limitation. The fullness of him is not there. The seed of him is. So we would press on in our seeking of you, Lord. This hidden life hidden in the shadow of the cross. The cross being the way. We say yes to you in this, Lord. All we can do right now is say yes to you, Lord. We don't even know what we don't know. What we can see in Acts is glorious, but there is a glory of you, of life and the release of it. That is so far beyond. It is the distinction of seed and fullness. We want, Lord, what you want us to have in this fullness. And with that fullness comes a fullness of joy in heaven and on earth. A rejoicing. And all that the creation has awaited coming coming Lord to be realized an unveiling of the sons of God an unveiling of the bride an unveiling of the overcomers and an expression of the super abundant life of Christ well we say yes to it Lord and posture our hearts with a yes Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. To what we cannot clearly see. But we trust you as we behold you, Lord. As we come within the shadow of the cross. And live there. You will release. You will unveil yourself. We ask for the release of the Lord now. And the unveiling of the Lord in His fullness of life. We ask for that, Lord. Here, Lord, in our generation, arise, Lord, in glory beyond the book of Acts. Arise, Lord, in fullness beyond the book of Acts. Arise in a people as a life in a people, the life and the light beyond the book of Acts. We ask for it, Lord. We contend for that and want to continue, Lord, before you to ask, to seek, to knock for what you have promised. And Lord, what you are already fully in agreement with. Align our hearts to it, Lord. We ask.
accept, Lord, accept this moment as a new beginning. We accept this moment, Lord, as the pushing of a reset button as pertains to our own thinking and our old thinking. Lead us up from here, Lord. We know that's your desire. We simply align our hearts with you in it. Yes, Lord, lead us up. Be, Lord, our guidance. Keep our eyes firmly fixed on you. Just say that to him. Keep my eyes firmly fixed on you, Jesus. Let them not deviate to the things of this world, to the carnal things of Christianity to the lifeless things of Christianity or the lifeless things and death of this world to the darkness of this world. They hold nothing for us. You need to say that to the Lord. Just say it to Him. The things of this world hold nothing but darkness and death and hold nothing for us. We will be a people of life, a people of the life and a people of the light that Jesus Christ is. We choose life. Now, Lord, let the realization, your own realization of that super abundant kind of heavenly life be ours. You're the giver of it, Lord, because you're the possessor of it. We bless you, Jesus. One final thing. This is just really key for us in this journey. Amid all the difficulty, all the hardship, all that goes on, there's something called joy, which is the mark of maturity. The joy of the Lord is our strength that is greater than weakness, greater than the circumstances greater than the difficulties and greater than the hardships. It's not happiness. That's earthy. It's joy. That is a part of the fruit of his nature. We receive from you, Jesus, a joy bigger than this world. <laughs> bigger than our battles. Bigger than this war bigger than our failures joy weeping may last for an evening joy comes in the morning the dawning of God's new day marked by joy well Christ is God's new day <laughs> And those his people, Lord, let us be marked by joy. Don't you agree? Let's stand up, raise our swords. You may think you got a dagger, but it'll grow into a sword. <laughs> Mine's still in the process. <laughs> Because it's the sword of the Spirit, so there's growth. <laughs> it's just barely starting to show itself outside of my hand now. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Gonna raise it up nonetheless. Let joy come now in your morning. You are the morning star, Lord Jesus. 
be that unto us now. Let your joy enter us. Let your joy enter us. Let it enter our homes. Let it enter our marriages. Let it enter our marriage, our families. Let, her, let it enter the congregations of God. Our hearts are yours, Lord. Fill us with your joy. Remove the heart sickness and heart disease. I mean that physically even right now. Remove heart disease and heart sickness across this congregation, Lord. Remove the scars that have owned people's hearts. Remove them. Remove those scars on your people's hearts, Lord. You can and you do heal scar tissue. Heal it, Lord. Heal it, Lord, though it's been the cut of religion, Christian religion, though it's been the cut of our brethren. Nevertheless, heal it. Heal it, Lord. Lest it channel us into patterns of behavior and belief, Lord, that are completely opposite of your will and your desire. Heal the scar tissue, Lord. Free us from the power of the pain, from the power of the hurt. For we have all been hurt. Nothing unusual about that. If you've lived, you've been hurt. <laughs> Seriously. We are not alone in the hurt or region. <laughs> but God is greater. That's the testimony. And he heals scar tissue. Wipe out the past so that the past has no present power over us. You are that great, Lord. You are that great. We bless you for it. Let's give him a shout. Yes, Lord. We shout unto the Lord with the voice of triumph. You have conquered our hearts, Lord. You have captured us. You have made us your bond slaves, your love slaves, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes. Let your joy come within us. Amen. We need the fruit of the Holy Spirit, don't we? You know, it's important to the Lord how we treat each other, how we interact with one each other, with each other. Um, that's important to the Lord. That's where people see the fruit of His life. Um, if we're treating people in every walk of life, in every arena the way the world treats people, then um, there's a problem. There's a disconnect. If you were here last week when Dan was speaking and he po popped on the screen and said, no signal. 
there's no signal. There's a disconnect. And uh, so I, I, I found that in my life over, over the past, well, more so over the past few months, um, just how much that means to the Lord. The Lord's really been speaking to me about that and, um, you know, sharing that with me. Um, we really need to ask for the fruit of the Holy Spirit because people and we ourselves know, will know them by their fruits. We will be known by our fruits, and we'll be known by our fruits before the Lord. And that's obviously based around the measure of Christ within us. We cannot accomplish this out of our own flesh. Um, if anyone's ever tried that, you'll figure that out real quick. We cannot produce Christ's likeness. Only Christ can produce himself in us, but we have to ask for it, and we have to be honest with ourselves and know that there's so much more that the Lord wants in us and through us, um, and to press on and into that. So, um, amen and amen. Um, uh, this isn't going to be the main thrust of my message, but I wanted to start off um, uh, with something the Lord uh, said to me this week. Um, I'll be honest with you guys, uh, I, I was talking to a friend of mine, Troy green yesterday and uh, the Lord's been really silent with me probably over the last four months I've been in a, a season of uh, be still and know that I am God which is good for all of us and I think we were hitting on some of that this morning um, so the Lord's been very silent I haven't heard much from the Lord honestly um, but he did speak to me uh, both the things I'm going to talk about he spoke to me very directly very pointedly and uh, so I'll, I'll share it um, these do correlate, but they don't. Um, everything in the book of the Bible correlates because it's all about Jesus, and it's all about building a people uh, that's worthy of uh, being his bride, uh, worthy of the bridegroom, and creating us in that image so we can marry the Lord. Um, so the first passage is in uh, Matthew 9, um, verse 17. We'll just start in verse 17, and Stick with that because this is what the Lord told me. Um, and uh, I think this is an encouragement to us. And uh, to this body of people uh, as well. Um, I, I feel like a lot of us have been waiting, waiting and longing uh, for the moving and the working of the Lord. Uh, most of us all of our life. I, I know for me personally, I felt that um, I'm... I'm supposed to be seeing more than what I am, you know, in the body of Christ and in myself individually. And a lot of times I feel like I'm in a wilderness season. And I know a lot of you just looking at your faces have been and are still walking in the wilderness season. And that is where the Lord makes his vessel. So I just want to encourage us this morning with this. Verse 17, um, Christ is, is talking about what he's, he's bringing, but in in context, you know, a lot of people would say that, well, this came at his death, his burial, and, and his resurrection. And I, I'll agree with that to a point, but I, I think, and I believe this, that the Lord is going to pour out more of his spirit now and at the end than he ever has before. He's saving his uh, best wine for last. Uh, John chapter 2, the miracle at Cana, is very clear about that, and I think it's prophetic. Um, and as the first, as his, was his first miracle uh, in those days, so will be his last miracle. Uh, he's going to pour out more of himself than he ever has, and he's going to fill his people. You know, the six pots there representing the number of man. He's going to fill his people uh, with more of his spirit and more of his life, and it's going to come through intimacy, though. And that's why the wilderness season, that's why the trying season and the forming season is because we have to be molded and made into his image so he, we can carry his spirit, so we can carry his glory. And that's what this passage says. Nor do men put new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wineskins burst. That would be us. We fail. We fall. Now, how many times have we seen that? The Lord come and sovereignly move, pour out his spirit, and then man gets in the way and destroys with the work of the Lord. Yeah. Destroys uh, the name of the Lord in that with self and flesh and sin. Um, uh, it continues on, and the wine pours out. That would be 
the work of the Lord and his name. It's poured out onto the ground, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into fresh wineskins, and both are preserved. That's what we want, isn't it? Wine, we want wineskins, that would be us, that have been so, pat, that have passed through the fire, been so purified, been so uh, ridded of our own self-life, our self-ambition, our own pride and arrogance, that God can fill us and pour himself out through us, and we can be uh, a conduit of his pure spirit, um, unmixed. You know, this is what we're going to get into here uh, with what the Lord gave me specific to this body. I think it deals with the body of Christ. I think it deals with this body as well. Um, but the Lord is looking for an unmixed vessel. Yeah. Mixture is no longer to be going to be tolerated in the house of God and in his people. He is going to distinguish between the holy and the profane. And, um, and that comes to all of us individually. It comes to us as a body, as the body of Christ. It's going to come to us individually, um, and how far we're willing to go and how far we're uh, going to allow the Lord to deal with our, uh, our hearts, to deal with our old man. Um, you know, the old man has been put away, and the vestiges of it are being put away. Dan talked about that last week. You know, there's scars, there's marred places, there's veils that still lie in our souls that uh, prohibit the Lord from coming forth in the way he wants. And um, only the Lord can fully do that work, but since this is a relationship and we're not automaton robots, the Lord requires and desires us to lay ourselves down, to ask and you will receive. Draw near to God, James 4. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Um, you look at the book of Revelation chapter 3, to the Laodicean church, the Lord is on the outside of his church knocking. Whoever wishes to eat and sup with me, open the door. And we've got to open to the, the door to the Lord. We've got to open the door to the Lord in our own hearts, allow him to come in and uh, purify, to cleanse, to prepare us for what he wants to do. Otherwise, friends, uh, I say this, and it's a challenge to my own heart. Nothing I'm going to say today is me up here saying, well, this has been completed in me. I, I know I'm far from it, as we all are, honestly. Uh, part of the miracle of this is going to be the Lord getting us there. <laughs> you know, how could he get me there? I don't know. It's going to be a miracle. All I need to do is just bow my knee to the Father. You know what I mean? That's all I know to do, and that's all I want to do. And to ride, and, you know, honestly, the wilderness is like a roller coaster ride. We're, hitting, we're going to different valleys and different peaks of mountains, we're seeing different aspects of the Lord, um, and we must consistently and constantly keep our eyes on the Lord because we're going to be tossed around by every wind and wave of doctrine because the Lord's going to show different aspects of himself to us. The Lord's really been bringing me last season and in in showing me how I can do nothing without him. It's only by his grace and by his mercy. And if I take that the wrong way and get into my flesh and start interpreting by my own mind, I think, well, this whole hyper-grace thing, they've got it all figured out. They're exactly right. That's not true. I'm seeing an aspect of the Lord that he wants me to be conformed to, that he wants me to take in and establish within me, and then he'll take me to a different mountaintop to see a different element of him. Because I can't see it all at once. I, I'm, I, don't know, I don't think as humans we can. We can't fully see the Lord. We're supposed to behold the Lord and be transformed, right? That's what Corinthians says. He takes us through different seasons and different circumstances to prove himself. That's what he did to Israel. He proved himself as their refuge, as their strength, as their warrior. And that's what he does to us. So, um, so again, I think that... Um, there needs to be, and we're hitting on this today, some in prayer, a great soul deliverance. The Lord has to put away our self. You know, one of the reasons Enoch was taken and the Lord finished his work in him, it says in Genesis that Enoch ceased, Enoch essentially ceased to be. The word there is that Enoch no longer was and he was gone. That's what the, the scripture says. The Lord told me it's because the Lord had dealt with his heart in a way that 
Enoch walked into the death that we all seek. Let's just put it that way. The Lord killed his self nature, his self life, his self seeking uh, ambition. And so the Lord was allowed, he, the Lord took him. That was what was accomplished. So much of what the Lord has to accomplish in us and the reason um, we go through so much stuff is t- to kill our selfishness. That is at the root of all evil. That was the beginning of evil and with Satan was his selfishness. So the Lord, if the Lord's going to fill us, he has to deal with herself. That's, it's very basic, I know, but that's the hardest thing to walk out in this life day by day, moment by moment uh, with the Lord and with the Holy Spirit and to submit to that. I know we all have bad days. <laughs> I have bad days. We all have bad days. To continue to go to the Lord. And let me just encourage you to continue to go to the Lord when you don't feel like it and ask the Lord to help you. Ask the Lord, Lord, give me your mind. And we need the fear of the Lord. If the fear of the Lord is wisdom, and wisdom comes from the mind, and we want the mind of Christ. Without the fear of the Lord, we can't have the mind of Christ. Yeah. It's a requirement. Amen? Yeah. So a while back, this was probably, um, this was actually the first Sunday where we did not have worship. Um, leading up to that uh, weekend, Dad had asked me to speak. And uh, I was praying to the Lord and was just, Lord, what do you want me to speak on? Normally, I don't get it this clear. Um, I did this time, and the Lord, uh, the Lord spoke to me. And he said, uh, actually, he said Numbers 3. Um, and I, I turned to Numbers 3. And you can turn there if you want. That's not going to be the main uh, part of what we're going to be reading out of. But in Numbers 3, it mentions um, the sons of Aaron. Uh, Nadab and Abihu, and uh, Heidi, where's Heidi, is Heidi here, okay, Heidi's back there, Uh, I didn't get to speak that week, Um, we ended up just praying, that was the first week where we had just constant prayer, we had no music or praise, and um, (laughs) Heidi and I were talking after, and uh, I didn't say anything about it, and she said, uh, you said that week, leading up to that week, right Heidi, yeah, she said leading up to that week, she had heard two names, and she didn't know who they was, she heard Nadab and Abihu. And that's exactly what the Lord um, spoke to me, was uh, Nadab and, Abah- and Abihu. So we're going to read uh, about that for, uh, for being mentioned as much as they are in the Old Testament. There's li- very little taught about them. Um, they're mentioned over six times. And, um, and let's actually start uh, on Exodus, in Exodus 24. Um, to learn a little bit about their story. You know, they were the sons of, uh, the, Nadab was the firstborn of Aaron, and Abihu uh, was the secondborn, and they were obviously in the Levitical priesthood. They were the first two anointed to be priests uh, with their father. And uh, before we get into Levi- Levi- Leviticus 10 and what's called the sin of Nadab and Abihu, I want you to see that these weren't just... Uh, disobedient, godless men. These men had seen the Lord. Um, There's a passage here in Scripture that not a lot of people talk about either. Um, Starting in verse 8, it says, So Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you in accordance uh, with all these words. Then Moses went up with Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, uh, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. And under his feet there appeared to be a pavement of sapphire as clear as the sky itself. Yet he did not stretch out his hand against the nobles of the sons of Israel, and they beheld God, and they ate and drank. That's a pretty amazing passage, isn't it? It was the last time you read that passage. Now the scripture says no one has seen God, so obviously they are beholding God through Christ. I think that would be safe to say. They're beholding the man, uh, we've been talking a lot about this, that Ezekiel saw, that Isaiah saw, the man Christ Jesus. Um, Now, we know they didn't have the Holy Spirit, and they know they didn't have an internal relationship with the Lord, but in that day, they had seen the Lord of hosts. 
okay? They knew the reality of their God, and they knew the holiness of their God, and that he should be treated as holy. That's said many times in the scriptures. I just want us to get a picture of that, uh, to correlate that. All this needs to correlate to our time. I'm not, we don't need to look at this just historically. We need to look at, look at this, what's going on in our time, what's going on in our own hearts. Um, they saw the Lord. You know, and you could make a stretch and and and, and apply this to uh, our day and our time, uh, speaking specifically in those who have entered into uh, what we call the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. You know, an initial seeing of God, and uh, I say that because I, I think that this story is going to apply. This reality in the scriptures is going to apply. We're going to see this in our time again. This will apply during our generation. Um, we will see this as we did in the beginning of Acts 2. I'm getting ahead of my, uh, Acts 5, excuse me. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but we will see this reality. Don't think this is just something Old Testament. This reality has been done, done away with. Here's, here's my point. Through all this, keep this in mind. When the Lord is reordering his house, Dan said this. He kind of set it up for me last week. When the Lord is bringing order to his house, when he's inaugurating his people in a new way, he always brings ultimate restriction and shows himself as holy to his people. He makes a distinction. The Lord is in a time of making a distinction again. It's a very dangerous time. Again, I say this in humility and, in, and hopefully in the fear of the Lord. There's a very dangerous time to play games in the house of God. To, to live in hypocrisy. I've had two dreams uh, over the last two weeks about hypocrisy. Hypocrisy in our own church, in the gathering, specific. One of them including me, so <laughs> I'm not pointing fingers. But warnings from the Lord. And we can all say, well, you're a hypocrite. Well, we all, we, all need to take, we all need to take a good look at our own hearts and ask the Lord to examine us. That's what Paul said. Paul said, I don't examine myself. Why? Because the Lord examines me. That needs to be our heart. Lord, examine my heart in this time. Because if we, these aren't my words, it's been said before, but if we want the glory of the Lord, the glory of the Lord is going to come. It's going to be sweet. It's going to be the sweet, savor of sweetness to some and the savor of death to others. It's going to be an incense and a sweet swelling aroma, and it's going to be a fire that cleanses and purifies. Now, I don't want us to see this just at everyone dying, you know, but will there be death? Very, very likely that that's, that will come. I don't want to be one of those. I don't want to be the one that the Lord has to make a statement to the rest of his house for, to be treated as holy. Um, now, if, there was, if it wasn't because I was doing something wrong, that wouldn't be so bad, you know? I'm sure there'd be some kind of good reward with it. I don't know, but maybe that's just me. But we don't want that, and uh, so... Anyways, keep your, when, as I'm going through this, keep your mind on our day, our time, and our own hearts. There's the corporate side of this, and then there's the, in, in, the individual side um, that we need to ask the Lord to help us with and examine our own hearts. Amen? Yeah. Okay, turn to Le Leviticus 10. We'll get in here a little bit more of the meat of this. Chapter 10, starting in uh, verse 1. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans. This is uh, the duty that the Lord had given them to burn incense. And after putting fire in them, placed incense on it and offered strange fire. This is what it says in Numbers chapter 3. Strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, It is what the Lord spoke. 
saying, by those who come near me, I will be treated as holy. And before all the people, I will be honored. You know, there's a lot in that. Um, in First Peter t- uh, chapter 1, verse 17 says the same thing. Be holy as he is holy. Uh, we are to walk in fear and trembling if we call God our Father. That's what First Peter 1, 17 and 18 says. Um, we are meant to be a holy people. And uh, the congregation of God... Uh, You'll see this theme throughout Scripture. As, as, as I mentioned this before, as the Lord really begins to gather His people again and show forth who He is, there's principles in that. There's principles with how the Lord deals with His people. This was a principle as He was setting up the law and the sacrifice of atonement He wanted the people to know that you don't do anything that I don't tell you to do. And if it doesn't begin with me, we are not going to have my ending. And to honor me. (laughs) You know, God is our friend, but he's also our God. He's also our king. You don't go before the king just any old way. You go before the king in awe and reverence. You go before the king on your knees. Amen? We need to know the Lord in that way. We know the Lord in our own, what we consider, we know what we think. Doctrinally, of course, we know the Lord as friend, you know. We don't know the Lord much as king, as the sovereign ruler of the universe, as the creator of all things, the beginning, the end, the alpha, the omega, the God of heaven and earth. We need to behold the king. We need to see the king as Isaiah did, high and lifted up and the train of his robe filling the temple. That we can cry out as he did, Lord, come and cleanse my my lips, cleanse my iniquity, cleanse my heart. Lord, everything in me that is selfish and, Lord, not born of you, cleanse me. Cleanse me. So by those who come near me, I will be treated as holy, and before all people, I will be honored. So Aaron therefore kept silent. Moses called also uh, to Mishael and Elzaphan, the sons of Aaron's uncle Uzel, and said to them, Come forward, carry your relatives away from the front of the sanctuary outside to outside the camp. Now, this is very similar to Acts 5. I mean, I don't know the last time you read Acts 5. Some of the same language is used here. Um, So they came forward and carried them still in their tunics to uh, to outside the camp, as Moses had said. Then Moses said to Aaron and to his sons, Eleazar and Ithamar, Do not uncover your heads, nor tear your clothes, so that you may not die. The Lord didn't want them to mourn the loss of their brethren. Reminds me of uh, the Levites. In the book of Exodus, when Moses comes off the mountain, he says, all those who are on the Lord's side come to me. The Levites took their swords and killed 3,000 of their brethren then and there. They proved that their heart was toward the Lord, even more so than their own family. They loved the Lord more than the, even their own brethren. That was God's judgment at that point in time. I'm not saying we're all going to grab our swords and go around chopping each other's heads off. God brought judgment at that time, and he used the Levites to do it. He used the Levites to enact it, much like he did with Israel. As they went into Canaan, those nations' time of judgment had come. It wasn't God was just completely, totally mad. The Lord had given them time in the past to repent. And even with the coming of Israel, there's a passage, I believe it's in the book of Jeremiah, that mentions... Um, one of the nations says, because they did not receive you as you received me, I'm going to wipe them out. Because yeah. Israel was carrying the presence of the Lord. Israel was the children of God at that time, showing forth God to the nations. And they knew, they knew full well, those nations, this is a bunny trail, but those, know, those nations knew full well that God was with them. Yeah. They mentioned it several times. 
God is with those people. Jericho knew it. They knew the God of heaven was coming with the people of Israel. Now, if they would have opened their doors and received them as receiving the Lord, I, I, this is me personally, this may be inaccurate, but I think there could have been a blessing of the Lord that they would have received. Of course, it would have been only in receiving God, but there were what was called proselytic Jews back in those days. They were received. They were allowed to come into the outer court, not into the inner as Gentiles, but they were a part of the congregation, what we would call the congregation of God. So we see here in uh, Leviticus 10, um, Let's keep going here. Uh, then Moses, in verse 6, Then Moses said to Aaron and his sons, Eleazar and Ithamar, Do not uncover your heads, nor tear your clothes, so that you may not die, and that he may not become wrathful against all the congregation. Now, that's an interesting passage. <coughs> an interesting wordage. We're going to have to learn this as we become more of a body. We become more united by the Holy Spirit. Our own sin is going to have an effect on our brethren. Our own lack of pressing on is going to have an effect on our brethren. What I do in secret is going to affect you. If we want the unity of the Spirit that we're asking for, that God wants us to have, which will be totally beautiful if we want Jesus Christ. And again, I'm not saying, well, you know, you've got to be perfect to be in this body. You've got to be perfect to be going on. But we do need to be being perfected by the perfect yeah. one, Christ, being increased and increased and increased to the fullest measure as we walk on this journey. If we don't want to go there, if we want to stop, if we want to turn back, that's going to hinder the entire body. Yeah. There's a principle in there for us to learn. God binds himself to his own principles. So this is a good opportun- uh, opportunity you know, to just mention this, um, you know, if, if, if we're here specifically, some of this is congregational, where any congregation you're at, but if you're there for a specific person or a specific teaching or a specific whatever, you like the steeple, the big steeple that's on the top of the building. I don't know what it is. I have a lot of TVs. I don't know. If you're there for any other reason than the Lord has told you to be there, you need to leave. You don't need to. You don't, you don't need to follow a man. You don't need to follow. You need to follow the voice of the Lord. Yeah. Just because you're not here in our congregation doesn't mean you're not in line or being aligned with what God wants. This, this body is a small, 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 small piece to a grand puzzle that the Lord is putting together among the nations and among this nation. Amen. You're... Because eventually what's going to happen is you're going to get upset at the man you followed here, or you're going to get upset at the teaching, and then you're going to become a stumbling block to this body pressing forward. You know? Or you're going to, the tongue will get released in the body, and it's going to cut. And many will be defiled by that. A bitter root will spring up. That's what the scripture says. Don't let a bitter root spring up and the many be defiled by it. We want to be exactly where the Lord wants us to be, and we need want to be in complete step with the Holy Spirit in every arena of our lives. That doesn't mean, again, that we're not going to have bad days. It doesn't mean we're not going to have questions. We need to go to the Lord when we do. Yeah. That's part of growing up and becoming mature in the Lord, is when those things come, we go to the Lord. He's our source. He's our life in all things. When the flesh rises up, we don't give it leeway, and we don't make excuses for it. We go straight to the Lord. Lord, help me. I need your help. Cleanse me. Purify me. Refine me, Lord. Is there a root here from my past that I need you to deal with? Is it an attack? Lord, is this an attack? Teach me how to fight. Teach me how to put on your armor. Verse 7 Let's continue, uh, finish verse 6. But your kinsmen, the whole house of Israel, shall be well the burning which the Lord has brought about. You should not even go out from the doorway of the tent of meeting, lest you die, for the Lord's anointing oil is upon you. So they did, according to the word of Moses. The Lord then spoke to Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine or strong drink, 
neither you nor your sons with you when you come into the tent of meeting so that you may not die. We've talked about that. I've talked about that, that before, even in the Nazarite vow of being separate from, separated from uh, the vine. Um, you know, if Jesus is the true vine, then there's a false vine. Yeah. Now, yeah. I can go deeper into that. I can apply that several different places. But in the book of Revelation, it talks about uh, those who did not eat of uh, the vine, essentially, or the grape of the vine of this earth, of this world. There is a vine that people <laughs> feed off, and it's called the spirit of the age. Yeah. And uh, we need to be completely <laughs> cleansed of that. We cannot drink of that cup. We must drink of the cup of the Lord. And make no mistake, this life that is in Christ is completely other than the life that's in the world. Everything the world produces is contrary to the life of Christ. Everything that the world would want to put on you and have come through you is opposite of what Christ wants. Because there's two kingdoms and, and at war here. Only two kingdoms. And if you're not in Christ, you're in the camp of the enemy. Yeah. There's different levels of that. There's different levels of the wicked and just the unrighteous. But I'm telling you, there's only two kingdoms. And when it boils down to it, Paul said it, you know, you have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light in God. Two kingdoms, dark and light. Two spirits, the spirit of the Lord and the spirit of the sage, the prince, the power of the air, whatever you want to call it, it gets down to the same reality. Um, part of the reason we don't see the growth of the Lord is because of our own willingness to be separated from the world and that spirit. I'm not talking about not going to work. I'm not talking about all those things that's been put on in the past because it's been an interpretation of the flesh. Though there are things the Lord's going to tell you not to do just to see how much you're going to be obedient. But that spirit must have no ground in us, must have no place in us. We are here, John 17, to know the Father and the Son whom He has sent. That's our purpose. Our purpose is not you know, people talk about the Great Commission. You know, Matthew, the end of the book of Matthew. The Great Commission is not to go into all the world and make disciples. Not firstly. Firstly, it's to know the Lord. Because if we don't know the Lord, we go into all the world and make converts, not disciples. And that's what we have. That's part of our problem is we have converts and not true disciples. Now, Jesus made a distinction between the multitude who was following him and his disciples. He shared the reality and the secrets of the kingdom with his disciples, not with the multitude. He spoke to them in parables. You know, the Lord, Psalm 25, 14, the Lord shares his secrets with those who fear him or with those who are Another translation says those who are intimate with him. Those are the ones who get close to Christ's heart, close to God's heart, who God um, will use not just for signs and wonders and the working of God, yes, but he'll reveal himself to those who are intimate with him, to those who fear his name. And that is part of the qualifying, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a qualifying going on in the season, the span of time. I don't know how long that is. The Lord hasn't sh shared that with me. I, I Just from the past four years in my own spirit, which sometimes for me that's stronger than even just hearing, is the weight of something the Lord puts in your spirit. It's stronger. Don't, don't, never fail to trust that, something that sticks with you, a burden. Um, that is, can be just as strong, and that's just as real as hearing or seeing. Um, a lot of things I, I would say I see or hear, I actually feel. And then I feel into seeing or I feel into hearing. Um, 
not the opposite. That's just me, and I'm not saying I'm fully trained in all that, but uh, I, I don't think we should uh, belittle that reality. Um, that is a moving of the Holy Spirit, and to trust that. Um, but there is a qualifying time for all of us where the Lord is inviting us into this uh, bridal reality, this bridal company, this people who, like Israel, will march across the lands and carry the presence of God. That's what the Lord wants is a people that are filled with his presence. But we must be purified to be able to carry that presence. That's something Israel never was, was completely purified. There was always a stain. There was always a marring. There was always um, someone who was ruining it, <laughs> for lack of a better word. You know, and I, I don't mean to say that harshly, but it's true. When is the Lord going to have a people that are completely clean and pure before his eyes, that he can lavish himself on in all of his many different ways, his manifest grace, and they're so outside of the self-life and all that's contained in that, that they don't take any of that unto themselves. They don't take any of the glory of it unto themselves. They don't take the grace of God and make it something about them and, and then use it to destroy God's own name by it. We, it's coming. I believe it's coming. I, I want to be encouraging that. That's part of why I was talking about the wineskins. The Lord is making the wineskins in this time. He's making it in us. He's doing this. All who can and want to come can. No one is disqualified. Not by invitation. Everyone is welcome. But it has to be combined with, cho excuse me, with choice, and it has to be combined with the laying of ourselves down. It has to be combined with no other source out of Jesus. He has to be our way, our truth, and our life in every single way, all the places that we, you know, compartmentalize the Lord, and this is where you can go, this is where you can't go, I'm keeping this back for myself, that can no longer be our way. He has to have all in all, he has to be all in all, he has to fill all in all, so that he can fill the universe uh, as he desires. So we're pressing towards that, we're looking toward that, we're beholding the Lord, and we're not looking to the left or the right. Right? Isn't that what we want? Isn't that why we're here? And if we're not here, we need, to, we need to either ask the Lord to help us to want to be there, or we need to go somewhere else where what we think it needs to be, because we don't want to hinder the people of God. Those who have the vision, those who don't have the vision, either need to ask the Lord to give me the vision, because without vision, the people perish. And we pull others down with us if we don't have any vision. And the Lord is beautiful and he's kind and he's gracious to always fill that need. If you have a pure and a sincere heart, the Lord will always come and give you vision and show you where he wants you to go. And I'm talking about an intimacy and relationship and fellowship of the Spirit with him. But if we don't want that and we find ourselves resisting that, we, we, we want to go somewhere that's... Uh, Maybe more a little line, a little more in line with our vision or whatever, or lack of vision, whatever you want to say about that reality. Uh, because there's so much blindness. There's so much blindness. And I know there's still blindness in my own heart, but Lord, remove that. Let your light come in and shine out all darkness and shifting shadow that's in, with, that's in me, that's, in with, that's within you. Lord, open my eyes to what the Spirit is saying to the church in this hour. Not last week, not last year, not six years ago. Lord, what are you saying in this moment to your people? Help me be aligned with that. Help me to, there be a yes and amen in my inner man with that. Amen? Okay, I got way off of what I was talking about, but <laughs> it's good nonetheless. We're talking, uh, so uh, referencing back up here to verse 10, uh, I want to I hit this because I'm just br break this passage down a little bit more. Uh, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans, which the Lord had given them, and after putting fire in them, that's the key. The fire, uh, Leviticus 16, is where the Lord reveals where the fire needs to come from, how the fire must be administrated for the burning of the incense. 
Now, before I go more into the fire, the incense, let's read it. Exodus 30, verse 34. Then the Lord said to Moses, take for yourself spices, uh, stacti, I don't know. Some of these words I'm going to obliterate. I'm sorry about that. And uh, on, on, onicha and galvano, spices with pure frankincense, there shall be an equal part of each. And with it you shall make incense, a perfume, the work of a perfumer, salted, pure, and holy. Now, didn't Jesus say in Mark 9, 49 that we're all going to be salted with fire? Mark, uh, uh, Mark 9, 49. He says, we will all, he says, everyone. A lot of people take that because uh, before that, verses 45 through 48, I think it is, the Lord is talking about hell. He's talking about those who will be... Uh, in hell, and their fire won't be quenched. But then he says, everyone will be salted with fire. That's everyone. That fire can even be, either be destructive or it can be purifying. It can be, it can be beautiful to us. Now, that deals with um, suffering. That fire will be a fire of suffering. We're all going to go through it. None of us are exempt. You don't have a get-out-of-jail-free card. This isn't Monopoly. <laughs> Suffering and purification. A lot of that su- suffering will purify you, but we're all going, going to undergo that salting with fire. Yeah. The purification. Verse 36, And you shall beat some of it very fine and put part of it before the testimony and the tent of meeting. So it must be very exact. Where I shall meet with you, it shall be most holy to you. And the incense which you shall make, you shall not make in the same proportions for yourselves. For yourself being the key. It shall be holy to you for the Lord. Whoever shall make any like it to use it as perfume shall be cut off from his people. Now, we know that Christ is the fragrant aroma, fragrant aroma which is sweet sm- smelling in the nostrils of the Lord, of God. Christ, here in Leviticus 10, is that incense. So when Nadab and Abihu take strange fire and mix it with the incense, this is not a small thing. This is mixture at its finest. This is what man can do and what man can bring mixed with God's holy and anointed, God's perfect, God's pure. Now when you see it in that light, that brings... Now did they understand that? No. But what they, they did understand is that the Lord hadn't told him to, how to burn that incense yet, which meant don't burn the incense yet. Wait until I tell you what to do. Amen? That's so much of what we struggle with today is, much like Saul, we don't know what to do, so we just do something. This looks good. Let's do it. Right? I, I, I've, I've done that. I'm not going to say I've never done that. I've done that. That's what David did with the Ark of the Covenant. And Uzzah lost his life. That's what Achan did, in a sense, in Joshua 7, when he went into Jericho. He took treasures when God said no treasures were to be taken. He was not obedient to the voice of the Lord. And that's interesting because that dealt with, uh, in Jericho, Rahab the harlot. Now, we've been talking about Rahab here and that dealing with worship. Um, I, I believe, let's just speak to the worshipers here. I believe part of uh, it was no it was not um, a coincidence that the Lord gave me this passage the week that music stopped. The Lord is unmixing the praise and the worship. He's wanting pure worship. This was worship, offering the incense. The priests offered up the worship before the Lord. Yeah. 
And that is what we are called to be. So the Lord is purifying that worship. That's one of the reasons it's been put on hold. And, uh, you know, I, I think that the Lord, or let's just say it this way, Leviticus 16 will come about. He will tell us, he will show you how this is to be administered. I don't know what all that means. I'm I'm not a musician. I'm I can't sing very well. I think I led us one time in a happy birthday song, and I just kind of quieted down after we got going because it's not very good. <laughs> but I do know that the Lord um, is that's a huge golden calf in the church yeah. is music. Yeah. It's entertainment. It keeps people from truly going to the Lord. They just go to the musicians. And some of it, I mean, and I'm not, I'm not saying 100%, some of it isn't necessarily the musician's fault or heart. It's the system. Yeah. It's what's come up. And for the Lord to deal with it rightly, sometimes the Lord can go in there and he can tweak it and he can change it and it'll be okay. It can be pure. Other times he has to wipe the whole thing out and start over. Unfortunately, the season we're in, most things, he's having to go in and wipe the whole thing out because we don't have the right foundation. And it deals with the the worshipers don't have the right foundation in and of themselves. And uh, there's a spirit of entertainment and a worldly spirit that's gotten mixed in. And the Lord's going to have to purify that before it can be on good ground, holy ground again. Um, But I think that's going to come. That's the encouragement. If the Lord is, if the Lord's um, talking to us about it, and the Lord is speaking to us about it, and the Lord's asking us to lay it down, that means He has a plan. You know, however He brings that back, it's going to be good, and it's worth being obedient and waiting until the Lord says, "Okay, now is the time. This is how you do it." He's going to give us uh, the blueprints of it. He's going to show us what to do and what to say and what not to do, what not to bring back, you know. Um, so there's that element to it, and I, I think that for this body was, was part of this word, um, but it's also a word to us individually. The fire represents the Spirit of God. And if we want to be worshipers in spirit and in truth, um, truth representing the incense in this instance, which Christ is the truth, okay? Truth isn't facts. You know, a lot of people go by the church and, you know, see the passages on their billboard and say, you know, I'll just put it this way. This sounds negative, but if you went by every church that had a billboard and read the passages and some of the things that were written on the billboard, not 100%, but you would say that church knows the truth just because they have a fact on their billboard. Truth is only in the spirit of truth, and that in Christ Jesus himself. And if it's not born in an inward reality, all we have is facts, right? Right? It's just as useless as anything else. It's just informational. And knowledge puffs up. So the fire is representative of the spirit. You know, so when you have um, Christ mixed with man's best you get death. You don't get life. You know, I believe this, that there has been a grace, because Christ is grace. There has been a specific grace that the Lord has given throughout, I don't know how many generations, that will be rescinded as we go forward. That the Lord, and this is how I want to finish on the mixture. The Lord is no longer going to tolerate mixture in his house and in his people. 
Now, is that a certain cutoff time? I don't know, probably. There's a passage in the book of Revelation, chapter 22, that says, let the righteous do continue to do righteously. Let the wicked or the unrighteous continue to do unrighteously and wickedly. The time has come for the judgment of God. And it's going to be a righteous judgment. You know, the passage uh, where it says, uh, seek the Lord while he can be found has come to mean more to me in the last few years than ever before. There are certain times and seasons that the Lord appoints. There's a time for everything. There's a time for the Lord to overlook things, and then there's a time for him to not overlook things anymore. We're coming into a time where he's not overlooking the sin, and not just the external sin. You know, people talk about the holiness of God, and I have too. Holiness of God, and it is who he is, Christ is holy. Christ is pure. So many people trying to arrive at holiness start at the outward and try to go inward. It has to be inward to outward. But holiness is really the purity of Christ. Now I say that, I mean Christ is obviously absolutely pure. He had no sin. But I mean it this way. Purity in us of Christ. No diluted mixture no muddied waters Christ in us untainted by our own flesh and our own way and our own will so the Lord is dealing with that strange fire in his house and he's going to respond with his own fire to some it's going to be beautiful We've been crying out for it. I've been crying out, crying out for it. Lord, send your purifying fire. Cleanse me. Malachi 3, which is prophetic. Refine me. Lord, let me be as silver refined seven times in the fire, in the furnace. Isaiah 4. Um, Lord, purify the filth of the daughters of Zion. But to others, it's going to be destructive. In his house. I'm not talking about on the earth. We know that, you know, the elements have been reserved for fire. Peter tells us that. But his people have been reserved for fire here at the end. The Lord is going to come to the entire body of Christ with fire. And depending on our hearts and our pressing in and the ability of, uh, not the ability of the Lord, but our own desire of the Lord to make us into that wineskin to be filled is going to uh, cause a distinction. There's going to be a distinction between those who've been asking, praying, humbling themselves, repenting, and those who have been resisting, saying, I don't need to repent. It's okay. My lifestyle is okay. My deadness is okay. And part of the reality of this, I, I think, again, Revelation 3 I wish you were hot or cold because you're lukewarm. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Mixture or mildness or lukewarmness is an abomination to the Lord. He would rather have you cold. Not my words. The Lord would rather have you cold than lukewarm. Because it's really the same thing. That's what I'm trying to bring out in this passage. Mixture is just as good as coldness. A little bit as Jesus. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not saying this completely across the board. I, I believe, amen, some people are saved and they may not press into the deeper realities of God, but at least they're not going to hell. Amen. I mean, you know, really. But, but in some ways, having a little bit of Jesus, and I know this from my personal life, I haven't been that deep, but to the depth that I've been, to go back now would mean a complete apostasy from the Lord. There is no way I could go back to a normal, self-centered, Christian, salvific relationship with God. You know, for those who have tasted of the good things to come, the tasted of the Lord in return, they, it's impossible to renew them to salvation. That's what the Scripture says. And I think that speaks to that reality. 
those who have gone deep, not because God won't forgive them, but because there's a searing of your conscience that and the enemy has a heyday with that. And your own heart, there's a hardness of heart that comes that uh, I don't want to experience, number one. But the good challenge in that is, is that the enemy, and the enemy starts trying to chip away slowly. He tries to get you to let your guard down. He tries to get you to compromise slowly. You know? It's really true. And uh, obviously, the enemy can only do what we give him the ability to do. For pressing into the Lord, even if there's battle, and there always will be, he's not going to have any power over us. doesn't matter if he takes her life. doesn't mean you're not going to get struck. Everyone's going to be salted with fire. One way or the other. The Lord will use the enemy to salt you with fire. I get a good dusting every now and again. <laughs> I've been being dusted the last few months, if you want me to be honest with you. But I know, and I know because I know the Lord. That's what keeps me, and keeps me close, is because I've, le- I've laid my head on the breast of the Lord Jesus. And I know on the other side, the Lord will bring about a renewal and a greater revelation of himself in my heart than I've ever known or seen before. Everything before will look like nothing compared to now. And that's part of sticking in the fight. And he who endures to the end shall be saved. He who endures shall gain the crown of life, which is Christ. Deep intimacy, deep friendship, deep fellowship, deep relationship, whatever you want to call it, the overcomer will receive the full reward of Christ Jesus. I believe that. I believe that with my own heart. That's something that burns within me, burns within my spirit to overcome as he overcame. Now, he didn't overcome just so we don't have to. He overcome, overcame as a forerunner that we may follow in his footsteps by his spirit and by his life. And let's just end. I didn't realize I've been speaking this long. Let's just end with a prayer. The Lord... You can stand or sit if you want. Maybe if you're two feet higher, you'll get closer to God. I don't know. I don't know how that works. but <laughs> Lord, would you, Father, purify our hearts. Lord, we're asking for your fire yes. to come and to take away, to drive out every, all strange fire, all false fire, Lord, that we would mix with you. Everything in ourselves, Lord, that we would taint your holy, beautiful, pure name with. Lord, would you remove it? Would you cast it? Would you expel it from us, Jesus? Lord, we want to be a pure and holy sanctuary, to be filled with your glory. Lord, we ask for your wind to come. Drive out every false thing, every foreign thing that is not of you, by you, through you, that does not bring glory to you. Jesus, we ask you to open our eyes in a fresh way, a fresh seeing of you. Lord, I ask for your encouragement to be upon your people. Lord, as we prayed this morning, a true joy in the Spirit would come in your people's hearts. Lord, that you would finish this work in us that you started, that you are completely capable and able to do it. Lord, all you require is a yes and a submission. Lord, let us be a people of utter and complete obedience. Father, I ask moving forward for this body, Lord, that we would not move without you. Not an inch, not a centimeter, Lord. We would be in complete step and alignment. Lord, take us individually, but take us corporately into the depths of your heart. Lord, what you've designed to be accomplished 
in and through your people in this time, in this generation. Lord, let it not pass us by. Let it not be missed. Lord, we want the fullness of you to be seen in this earth. That the God of heaven would be represented on this earth. That your kingdom would come. Your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven, Father. Lord, we thank you that you have not left us. You would not leave us as orphans, Lord, that you are faithful. Lord, I just ask for encouragement. Encouragement to your people. Encouragement in the midst of battle and trying times. Lord, even encouragement when our flesh and our soul rises up, Lord, to, to look to you, to humble ourselves before you, to be quick to repent, Lord, and, and beyond that, to ask for your brokenness yes. within us, yes, Lord. that your brokenness would remain, Lord. Yes, Father. And Lord, I, I, I ask for myself and for my brothers and sisters, Lord, a childlike dependency on you. Lord, that as we're around you and as you hold us, Father, that we would just look up to you and be completely reliant in every way upon you, our Heavenly Father. Lord, cut off, cut off every uh, root that is not you. You are the true branch, the true root, Lord. Lord, I ask that our past would have no power over us. Every root that's embedded itself, that's lodged itself in our inner man, in our soul, Father, that you would cut it. Lay your axe to the root. You are a good gardener. You are a good God. We trust you, Lord. We just say that to the Lord. Lord, we trust you. We don't trust ourselves. We trust you, Lord. Your ways are good and right and perfect, Lord. Give us your mind in this season of time. Give us your, the mind of your will. Lord, you work all things according to the counsel of your will. Not our will, not man's will. Your will. Lord, we want to be aligned with your will. And let there be a joy in that reality, Lord. Not a, not a hardness, Lord. Not a weight, not a burden in a negative sense of how hard this is going to be, Lord. Let there be a joy on this journey with you. Yes. An enduring joy to follow you, to walk with you. Lord, the bond of the cross, Lord, carrying the cross. What a joy it is, what an honor it is to bear the cross as our Savior bore the cross. Let us see that, Lord. Yes, Lord. So easy sometimes to see the heavy side of that, the hard side. And it is hard to carry our cross daily. But Lord, there's a bond there and there's a grace there. Because no one else has ever borne that cross with you but your people those who are aligned by the Spirit with you. It is a bond of love. The cross is a bond of love. Let us see it that way. Let us see it in a fresh way, Jesus. We love you, Lord. There is no other way for us. There's no turning back. It's only up with you, only higher with you, Jesus. Lord, we will not allow this earth and the things contained in the earth to prevent us from going higher. We will not allow past offenses and hurts and wounds and scars and sins to keep us from going higher with you. Lord, we will not allow 
us to miss our destiny to be conformed to the image of Christ Jesus for any temporal thing. You are lasting. You are forever. You sit on your throne in heaven. And even now you sit on the throne of our hearts. Make that real to us, Lord. Help us to see you, Jesus, high and lifted up. High and lifted up. High and lifted up above all problems and issues, all struggles, Lord. You are higher. And we would come up with you, Lord. We would sit with you. We would sup with you, Lord. We would not eat of the dust or of the earth or of the carnal. We would eat of the heavenly. We would drink your flesh and eat your blood and therefore be qualified to sit with you in heavenly places, O Lord. Jesus, Lord, let your illumination by revelation come. I see, I see the Lord just releasing light, light into our inner beings and in our innermost Innermost being, you know, light dispels darkness. His increase brings our decrease, not the opposite. Let that light come and have its full way, Lord. No resistance in us. We would be a holy habitation of your light and your presence and your glory, Lord. From now on and forever, evermore. Yes, Lord. Pour out your wine. We won't be drunk on the wine, Lord. Yes. Or the gifts of the Spirit. Yes. That we would be established in you, Lord. Yes, Lord. That we would not burst and be ruined, Lord. Yes, Jesus. Yes. Establish us, Lord. Yes, Lord. Nothing from the past, Lord. No looking to the past. We look into your new day. In your new way, Lord. You are that way, Lord. There's nothing new, Lord, in, in that aspect. But, Lord, you are doing, I believe, a new work. Bringing us to you. To you. Intimacy, relationship with you. You're plumbing the depths. You're purifying. You're cleansing. Like Jack said that we would not see anything or desire anything but Christ and Christ alone, our solid rock on which we must stand, the rock that is higher than we are. Take us up onto that rock. Take us into the cleft of the rock, Lord, as you did Moses. Oh, Lord, and that we not, would not just see you pass by and see your back. Lord, we want to see you face to face. Lord, we cry out like Moses did. If we found any favor, favor in your sight, Lord, let us see your glory. Let us know your ways that we may know you, Father. Lord, let not there be a veil over our eyes. Let there not be a veil over our face like Moses had to wear, Lord. Remove the veil. Remove all veils off of us, Lord Jesus, that we would see pure light pure glory of the Lord and be so transformed inwardly into that reality. Lord, you do whatever you want to do externally, but we want the inward life of Christ fully established with us 
and in us. Yes, Jesus. Yes. The prayer. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. I, I just uh, see the Holy Spirit in a very uh, basic way working on our hearing right now, our ears. God's giving us the ability to hear clearly. Some of us in the room very clearly. Lord, we do not want to turn away from your voice. We do want to turn toward you. It's simple. We turn toward you, Lord, not away. We turn toward you. We need to know you, Lord, and we want to know you. Be greater than our darkness. Be greater than our fears. I ask you to bind darkness right now so that we can hear and we can turn without fear, without fear of the unknown. We turn towards you, Jesus, in the power of your love. The power of your light to deliver us from our own darkness and the darkness in our hearts and minds. We turn towards you. I urge us right now, turn towards him. Turn toward him. Turn towards his light. Not away. We begin, Lord, a journey in the light shatters and scatters, Lord, the darkness in us. Shatter the darkness, Lord. Shatter it. Let it not ever recover again. Such a shattering of you, Lord, that it cannot recover. That its grip be completely broken off of our minds, off of our hearts, off of our desires. By the authority of the Lord, shatter the darkness. And it's death grip upon our minds and upon our hearts. We are meant to be freed from such darkness, such death. We give you permission to do it, Jesus. And be that unto us right now. We turn towards you. Lord, in our finite understanding, so much of you, Lord, we do not know, but we turn towards you. Help us, Jesus. Help us. We know you love to help us. Be our help now, Lord. Be our help. Holy Spirit, be our help, we ask. Lord, seal this in us. Well, let this not just be a two-hour meeting on Sunday, Lord. Let this be a reality. What a step, a giant step on this journey to you, to the goal that you are, Lord. Lord, seal it in us. Continue this work in us, God, and keep our eyes up. Keep our eyes up and filled with your light.
You are always in movement, and you are always pushing towards growth, Lord. Lord, we don't want any stunted growth. We want a growth that comes from God. Amen. God bless you guys. Well, you guys, I got to ask you something. Terry said earlier that he's got a dagger in his hand. The shorter the sword, the closer the warfare. This man's under it all the time. Will you lift up our brother in prayer? Because this is something that's in your